Howdy. Look at this. All well, these people are asking, are we going to hold class Friday? I don't want to come to class Friday. Heck, you don't come to class Wednesday. <laughs> well, you guys do, but you're the good guys. <laughs> All right, I don't know how far we got on talking about holes in beams. I remember we had something started on them. We mentioned that when you put a bending moment on a wide flange and you have had to drill some holes in the flanges that you don't care about the compression side because the compression stresses will yield the steel around the holes and then the holes will just fetch up against the bolts and the forces will go right through. Only if you have holes on the tension side do you possibly have to account for them. If you don't drill too many holes and they're not too big, they find out it really doesn't change anything. But they do insist that this flange on the tension side had been planned to carry some load. The load that that flange had been planned on carrying was F sub Y the F sub U is okay in a minute. F sub Y times the area of the flange. The flange with no holes in it. That's what you told me you were going to give me. Now when you drill the holes, you say, but I don't have the area of the flange anymore. It's no longer area flange gross width of the flange times thickness of the flange. It's going to be a little smaller because I drilled some holes in it. And we find, well, that's not too bad. We can go ahead and let the stresses around those holes build up to the ultimate without hurting anything. That's exactly what you and I did on tension members when you were studying around the holes. You ran the stress from F sub Y up to F sub U, and it was acceptable. You had to make some corrections sometimes. So I say, what I need you to do is, I need you to go tell me how much you told me you were going to give me. F sub Y times the area of the flange gross. And if the force that you are going to give me, which is going to be F sub ultimate times the area of the flange, including the holes net, if that force has come up to what you told me you were going to give me, then that's okay. We will not worry about holes. However, you do have to consider the holes. You will have to drop the strength. If you can't tell me that the net area, when under the full F sub U, if that force is smaller than you planned on giving me, then you're going to have to reduce the strength of the beam due to the holes. Otherwise, you can walk on and ignore it. Not actually. It's a little different from that. If it was that simple, more people would do this for a living. So we're saying that the flange, force in the flange, in other words, the strength available at F sub U, including the holes, if it's smaller than how much full strength was desired and you told me you were going to give me at the yield stress without any holes, then you will have to reduce the strength. And we'll talk about that shortly. All the terms are defined, area flange net, that's without the holes, uh, that's with the holes, area flange gross is without the holes. Here are the page numbers in the uh, specs that give you these same equations, and it's on page 244D also. Now we've run into another problem. It used to be when A36 was about the best we had, A36 would come up here, and it would just yield like crazy, and then it would build up here from 36 maybe to about 58, and then it would pop. And that was really good steel. All of that ability to distort and deform really helped us in a lot of ways. Now then we've got this high-strength stuff, A992, where F sub Y is up to 50, and F sub U maybe is up to 65, and the distance between when the thing yields and when it has reached F sub U, 
that doesn't have near the range that I'm used to seeing when we first set out this criteria for holes. And so if you've got a bad steel, one where you're running the stress up to maybe, I don't know, about 10% of the ultimate, rather than running it up to about maybe 20 or 25% of the ultimate, then the fibers just don't get to stretch like I had planned. So if you have a steel where the ratio of the yield to the ultimate is higher than 0.8. That's a, not a very ductile steel, and it's really ductile, but it's not like we had planned. Then, rather than having you check, what did you tell me you were going to give me? And are you going to give me less than that? You have to consider the holes. I'm going to tell you for those kind of steels, I want you to tell me what you were going to give me. And because the steel we're discussing is not as ductile, I want another 10% tacked onto what you told me you were going to give me. If you can't bring your F sub U times the area of the net flange with the holes, at least up to what you told me you were going to give me times 1.1, then you're going to have to consider the holes just because of the steel you're using. Nothing wrong with it, it's just not as ductile. So what they do is they write the equation all in one swoop, and they say if this is less than this, you must consider the holes, where this factor Y in tension is a 1 if you've got a really great steel where F sub Y is down pretty much below F sub U, about 80%. But if it's uh, higher than 80%, then you have to give me another 10% on this strength side. And if you can't do that, then you must consider the holes. That's a completely different process. This is just telling you whether you must or must not consider the holes. Now, if you look at A992 steel and you look at the numbers, you would say, well, okay, the yield is 50 and that's 65. There's A992, 6550. You'll find that that 6550 is down below the 0.8. So you say, hey, I should be okay on A992 steel. Well, it's kind of been what you get in the A992 steel. In an A992 steel, you can have 50 to 65, and it still has A65, A992 name. And this is a guaranteed minimum of 65. Now, if this guy happens to run this 65 up to 80, and you know it, and this happens to come out 50, then 50, 85, you don't have to do the A992 steel. It doesn't have the 1.1 problem with it. But what happens is this 50 can go up to 65, and it's still got the name A992 steel. And so it's very possible you'll get a steel where this number is actually, when you get it, 60. And the 65 is what he gave you, too. And the 60 is dang near right on top of the 65. And I, I can't live with that. I mean, I can live with it, but it has an impact on whether or not you have to consider the holes. And since they don't tell you, you always have to put the 1.1 on an A992 steel. If you call them up and you say, I know you got 800 tons of steel out there for me. You got tests on all of it? Says, well, it came out in about six batches, but we got tests on all of them. What is the F sub Y and what is the F sub U? If the F sub Y over F sub U is eight tenths or less, then, and you can come up with this right here, you don't have to consider the holes, even for an A992 steel. But if you don't know, and you won't know on a quiz, because I won't know, I won't have the test specimens you'll have to include A992 in this 1.1 problem area. Now, the reason for it is this, and I hate to take time to show you reasons for things, but I think it's the only reason that you really learn anything is if you see why these things are happening. Here's an A36 steel. In 305, you learned that around a hole, you have a stress concentration factor, which raises the stress quite a bit, maybe a factor 1.6, maybe 2, 
above the average stress across the section. So when you put in a load on this plate, this stress runs right on up to yield. There's your yield. And these are down around 18, and this is down around, who knows, 22. And when you put some more load on it, then this fiber yields, and it stays at this yield, and it stays at this yield, and it stays at this yield, and then this one comes on up, and it gets to yield, and then this is down to 25. Then when you put some more strain on it, well, this little fiber here, he's, he's going on up the curve. He's getting on up to around 50 before this fiber finally gets to the 36 we're counting on. But that's okay, because he's well under this peak, this break point, and therefore A36 steel is behaving like I need to because of your holds. Now here's a piece of A992 steel, one where we don't have the ductility as we do in the A36. Same idea. First off, the stress goes up K times P over A because of a stress concentration factor, and it reaches the yield of 50, while this one's still 25. Then when you strain it some more, this fiber does stay yielded, stay yielded. A few of them are getting above yield because they're starting to climb on up this different-looking curve. And then when you finally get this one to 50, this guy's out here to 70. And that's not going to cut it. I can't, I can't stand that. You're out there past... Uh, the breaking point. And that's why for some steels, I'm going to have to ask you to give me 10% 10, 10 more on the front end just to see whether or not holes have to be considered. On a piece of A36 steel, it's very easy to come up with a case, even though it's nice and ductile, where the holes have to be considered. Here's a case where the holes have to be considered. There you go. Yeah, holes got to be considered. In other words, there's no way you get enough F sub U out of those little pieces to take care of all the F sub Y that you lost. So here's now, if you have the bad news that you have to consider the holes. First, you have to cut your elastic section modulus down to account for the holes. First off, the whole equation is really kind of changed. You used to say that the nominal moment was F sub Y times uh, Z. Now then, we're going to make you, we're going to let you run it on up to F sub U. The first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to drop it back to the elastic section modulus from the plastic section modulus. So basically, here's the bad news. Number one, you don't get to use Z sub X. You have to go back to S sub X. And that number will have to be reduced by the small area divided by the large area. That's basically your bending strength. The good news is you get to run the F sub Y all the way up to F sub U. So rather than the old case where M sub nominal was equal to F sub Y times Z sub X, number one, you get to run the F sub Y up to F sub U, but you got to drop the Z sub X down to S sub X. It's shown that it works best. And not only that, you don't even really get the S sub X because of the holes. The only reason you're even here is because you have to consider the holes. You have to reduce the elastic section modulus by the ratio of the net area of the flange with the holes divided by the gross area of the flange without the holes. That's your nominal strength. Now, there are many more nominal strengths that you've got to also check. You got to check the nominal strength due to lateral torsional buckling. You got to check the nominal strength due to web local buckling. I guess not. Flange local buckling. I mean, all those other things still have to be checked. This is just at that point, wherever you probably are trying to find the maximum moment at a given point in the beam, 
you're going to have to see if the beam uh, will handle that moment. So basically, he summarizes it as follows. Does your ultimate force available in the tension flange under ultimate load, ultimate stress, area truly there, is it smaller than the 1 or 1.1 factor depending on your steel multiplied times the yield stress of your steel times the area you told me was going to be there before the guy with the drill showed up? If that is true, then you must account for the holes. And the way you do it is this. The nominal moment is equal to F sub U. Area of the flange with the holes, area of the flange without the holes, elastic section modulus for the shape under discussion. Where this is either a 1 or a 1.1. And he kind of forgets to tell you. Whereas, if F sub U area of flange net is greater than or equal to this, then you get the full plastic moment. Even though you got the holes there, you do not have to account for them. I mean, in effect, you have accounted for them because of the studies that you've done, and we find that you can that the moment developed will be the full M plastic. Of course, the fees got to go on everybody before they really get out in use. But we're talking about nominal moments, nominal moments, just like the specs do. Uh, yeah, that's that's the only ones that probably are going to be connected like this. Angles, you know, probably just going to be connected on one leg, and we've already found out how to take care of them. All right, so he has a problem. It's a W18 by 71. You can find the information on it on this page, and I got a page here with 18 by 71 information. That flange, wide flange has a 7.64B sub F and it has a 0.81 thickness. It is made out of A992, and since I don't have tensile coupon tests on it, I'll have to consider the 1.1 as a requirement. He says use C sub B is equal to 1. Well, I can tell you whatever he, he hasn't shown me his moment diagram, but I bet his moment diagram doesn't look like that. That's not this case, because if it was, he'd be telling me to use a C sub B as 1.14. This case here must either be this one, where it's 10 feet long, that's the 10 feet unbraced length, with constant moments on either end, or possibly a beam, brace, 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 equal load, where the moment in the region of study is M sub A, M sub B, M sub C, M max, and C sub B is 1. If he tells me that, must be one of these cases. Now, just to divert a minute and see where this stuff is in the specs. Proportions of beams and girders, 16.164. Here's where this is greater than this. The limit for tension rupture does not apply. All that's saying is, you're, you're cool. You don't have to study any whole information. Whereas if it's less than that, then you must account for the holes, and this is how you account for the holes, and then, of course, all the terms are defined. Continuing with our 18 by 71. First off, he wants to know if it's going to flex, uh, fail by lateral torsional buckling. I'll leave it for you. This is old stuff. Uh, the curve looks like this. Uh, there are tables that tell you L sub plastic and L sub R. We're at 10 feet, so we're on here. If you remember, there's that equation for that straight line. you got to go dig out M plastic, F sub Y, S sub X. Your brace length is 10 feet. L plastic is 6. L radius of gyration is 19.6, blah, 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 blah. And that's how strong it is if it's laterally torsionally buckling if that controls but since it's got holes in it I don't know whether this will control or web local buckling will control or not web flange local buckling or if those holes are going to cause the problem so now this is new 
Incidentally, when this person was calculating this stuff, he calculated the plastic moment as F sub Y, Z sub X. That is not permitted if this was a W14 by 99 with an F on it. Remember, the Z sub X is true, and that's true. But that number right there may not be true if the flange, see this flange, if the flange has problems in, in bending. About the best way you could get the number that goes right here would be go to your uh, Z tables where it gives you phi in plastic and divide the phi back out so you can get the real web uh, flange local buckling plastic moment and use it in this equation. The other possibility would be to go dig this rascal out and track it down until you got to 10 feet from those charts. So here's our new stuff. First, we're going to see if the flange holes need to be accounted for. Gross area of one flange is uh, 7.64 inches wide, 0.810 inches thick, that's how much area you told me you were going to give me. And then I see this guy with a drill walking over here. Effective hole diameter, one inch plus a sixteenth fit plus a sixteenth damage, one and an eighth. Therefore, the gross area of 6.188. You took off the thickness of the flange twice times the diameter of the hole. Jeez, man, that's a, that's a lot of lost steel. You brought the steel area down to 4.3. Question is, what did you tell me you were going to, what are you going to give me? You're going to give me 65 KSI times this teeny area left over after the drill guy left. That's 238 kips. Whereas you told me you were going to give me 50 KSI times 6.188, which is something else. And not only that, because you're using this crummy non-ductile steel, even though it's wonderful stuff, you got to give me a 10% increase of that before I compare. You told me you were going to give me less than this times 1.1. That's what I got to have. You didn't do it. You came nowhere near what you promised me. You must account for the holes. You simply account for the holes by give me the ultimate strength, 65 KSI. Give me the flange area with the holes, 4.366. Give me the flange area without the holes, 6.188. Go dig out the elastic section modulus of 127. And that's how much moment you can have. Uh, that's M sub N. That's how much you can't have it. You've got to give me a 0.9 on top of it. This value is less than we found. 64.60 was for lateral torsional buckling. This controls. Since the value is less than that, it controls. Here he's divided it by 12. And then he didn't complete it really because before anybody can really hand it out, you got to put the point nine on it before it goes out the door. 436 kip feet. Here is the information used in that. Went to the Z tables. Went to a W18 by 71. There's your L sub R. There's your L sub P in that equation. Here's your 18 by 71. There's your flange width. There's your flange thickness. Here's your 18 by 71. Here is your elastic section modulus. How much did it change? See, it changed, you know, pretty much because when the web yields, it, it picks up some numbers. But they don't, they don't let you have that. You drop to the elastic section modulus. Good morning. You know, if, if you're going to come in late, I mean, it's not real late, but if you're going to come in late, you should... And then I don't pick on you because I, well, the poor guy ran all the way to get here. 
Either that or limp, you know, like a car ran over you. Yeah, yeah, something. Okay, okay. All right, now this is out of the 13th edition just because I wanted these notes on the side, didn't want to rewrite them. It's the same information as yours. How to find, this is where I told you if you'll just track down a W18 by 71, you can get the nominal moment. You just go to the Z tables and you find out where a W18.71 comes in. The Z tables would tell you immediately. Easy to find in the Z table, 548. And then you simply track it down. You say it's not the lightest. That's not my problem. And when it hits 10, then that's how much plastic moment, phi sub m sub p, you get off of it, lateral, off of it according to lateral torsional buckling. Sometimes that's well worth doing. On the other hand, if you're trying to track down this 18 by 76, you may be five pages back. Came down here, and the next page came down here, and the next page came down here, next page you're finally here, and you're finally to the 10 foot mark. You know, sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. And uh, his use of that equation is appropriate because it tells you how to get it without going through those uh, different pages. This is the same one in the 14th edition. Already did holes in beams. Already did that. Already did that example problem with my notes on them. Open steel web joists we'll come back to if we have some time. Let's see when the last time we had time. 1982. All right. Base Beam bearing plates and column base plates. On the exam, you will invariably be asked to design a base plate or to design a bearing plate. You need to know the difference. This is a column. This is the base of the column. A piece of steel of reasonable thickness so that you don't just poke a hole in the steel along with the concrete. That is a base plate. And usually it'll say in the column to be used on the problem, also telling you it's a column base plate. The design of this is quite different. Here is a beam. A beam has no base. So you can, this is not a base plate. This is a plate where the beam presses on the concrete and the plate bears on the concrete like a bearing stress. Is there a bearing stress under here? Yes, there is, but it's not called a bearing plate. It's a base plate. And I don't do that to just mess you up, but every now and then you give me a beautiful design for one of these, or you don't because it's so difficult. You know, this one was simple, or vice versa. So know the difference between a bearing plate and a base plate. You can't hardly go wrong. Columns have a base. Beams don't. The whole purpose is so that when you push on the concrete, very weak, with this high-strength steel, you don't just gouge a little H-shaped hole in the concrete. Put a steel plate between the two. Same way with this one here. This steel is quite strong. You can have such high loads that the concrete's only got maybe 3,000, 5,000 PSI, where this stuff in here, we're talking about 60,000 PSI strength. You can mash a hole right in the wall or right in the concrete footing with these things. You need a plate underneath them to spread the load out so the concrete is happy. Yes, sir. Uh, it can be, but generally speaking, if the thing is always in compression, they're gonna they're going to put some holes in it, yeah. yeah, because invariably, you know, you get wind loads on the columns and things like that. They'll put a bolt and they'll put they'll embed it down in the concrete. Now, then, on a bridge, a lot of times the ones I see they don't do that because there aren't any loads sideways generally. Uh, they just sit it on top of a bearing pad and it sits there forever. But if you wear suspenders and a belt, bolt it down.
your friends may let you and then say, look, look what this guy spent $800 bolting that plate to the ground. Har, har. All right. Now, uh, just between you and me, you see I have a little investment in pictures here. Uh, and unfortunately, in this book, in this Segui, they and in the code or in the specs, they call this length of the bearing pad, they call it N. And they call the width of the bearing pad B. So the area of the bearing pad was N times B. The new uh, specs call it length of the bearing pad. So you just have to bear with me any place you see. Oops, there's one right there. Anytime you see an N, just think length of the bearing pad. Most of them I think I've found and I've already marked them. Use these notes. Here's a top view. Here's a beam coming across. We're going to do bearing plates uh, first. Here's a concrete footing, or it could be a part of a wall which extends out in both directions. Here's the plate, and the beam is set on top of it. There's your steel plate. Here's your beam. Here's your concrete column or your concrete footing. It's top view. Here's a kind of an end view. In your book, it's an end view because he doesn't show it, the 3D stuff part to it. This is B. This is the length of the bearing pad. And then it sits on top of something that's weak, like concrete or masonry. Here's a side view. This, again, is L sub B. Here's the web. Here are the flanges of the beam. Uh, that force under that plate actually feeds up into the beam so that the stresses go up nicely at about a two and a half to one. They find that out just by putting strain gauges on there. And it goes up through the flange and it goes up through the fillet. You remember there's a flange here and you remember that fillet? It goes up through that until it hits the really thin part of the web. So there is an area of the web where right about across here, it could start to yield the web of your wide flange. We'll have to make sure that doesn't happen. The uh, way that could happen most obviously, I got a picture of one of them here. It'd have to be ridiculous. I don't know, I may run across one. But where you make this thing very, very short, just just about an inch long, well, then there's a good chance when that load feeds into the web, the web will yield at that point. Remember what you've already studied. You've already studied that the web itself will withstand the reaction due to shear, VQ over IT, or in our case, V over the area of the web. But if you can't, if it yields here before it gets into the web, then you still lost. You still came out behind. Here's how it yields. Here's an end view of a wide flange. Here is your B. Could be that B is the same as B sub F. Usually it's a little longer than B sub F, kind of so you can see them hanging out. And then it has some length, which we will have to design for. This is always going to be at least B sub F. You wouldn't want a little 8-inch plate under there. You want the stability of this thing sitting on it. Here's your K design. That's the distance to the through the web plus this radius. Here this load is feeding up in here and cutting out at about a two and a half to one angle. And that's a longer length. And you find that when you put this reaction force that you've asked for over this thin, kind of long cross-sectional area in the web, you can go up to F sub Y. If you go above F sub Y, I'm not, I'm not going there. That'll be your limit. Here is your nominal strength. Um, 
Let's look at this one will be as good as any. Your nominal strength will be, he shows this like a 45 degree angle. That's no fair. It's a lot flatter than that. It's two and a half to one. Your length of this line right here will be L sub B plus two and a half times K design. That's how long that will be. I think I surely I got a better. Here we go. This is a better one right here. Here's your plate. Your plate is uh, L sub B long. Here that force is feeding up into your thin part of the web, which starts right about here at K design. So the length of that line where the stress has got problems is L sub B plus two and a half times K sub design. They just call it K. Here's your 2.5 K design plus L sub B. That's the length. Here's your width, thickness of the web. You can see it right here. And then you get to multiply that times F sub Y. That's if you got a plate on the end of the beam. I'm kind of using his figures. Here we go. I like that better. There's your L sub B plus 2.5K design. Here's a beam that's coming across the top. This is a girder. This is a floor beam. The floor beam's got some pretty high loads in it. <clears throat> they have decided they need to put a plate between the two to keep the stresses down. And when they do, this is L sub B. For an interior beam, this thing feeds off to the left at a two and a half to one rate, and it feeds off to the right. So now then the length of the yielded web at the thin part is L sub B plus five times K design. So for exterior or close to the end plates, the length of the line is that long. For interior beams, for interior loads on top of your girder, L sub B plus 5. That's why this one has the 2.5 plus L sub B, thickness of the web, F sub Y. This one has 5 times K design plus L sub B. I don't see offhand where his nominal strength is, but it's obviously that length right here times F sub Y thickness of the plate, probably on a future page. All this stuff is on section 16.1-134 page. Interior plate. Here's an interior plate. Here's where it comes from in the specs. 16.1-134. That yielding is so reliable and so tightly controlled, you don't need any variation. You get it all. Whatever you get, it's yours. And here is the R sub N for an interior plate. I know that because it says a 5. And here's one that's close to the end. I know it because it's only got a 2.5 on it. Plus L sub B, there's your F yield. You'll notice he calls this F sub yield in the web because it's, a, it's very common to make up your own beams. You'd make this out of A992 steel, and you'd make that out of A36 steel because A36 is a lot less expensive, and you're not getting a lot of bending strength out of the web anyway. And therefore, he wants you to be sure that you're talking about yielding the weaker steel. He wants you to put in the yield for the web, not for whatever other pieces are on there. We don't usually talk about those, but it's here, so you, you, you should question where that came from and why. Now, not only can you just flat yield this steel, when the load gets up into your poor old thin web, you can actually cripple it. 
By that I mean when you put the load on here, let's see if I've got a picture right quick. This one, the load was put on the top here. The web just buckles to the side. Here's a crippled web where the load coming up from the bottom, there wasn't any load on the top on this one, and it just, it didn't yield the steel, but it was just too thin, and so the web crippled or buckled. Here's one where the top flange, see they were pushing down, so this is a compression side. The top flange had local buckling problems, and if you look, you can see that the web is also having problems. It's pooching out and bending in and out of the paper here, causing a buckling problem of the web. This one's quite evident. You'll notice it's a, a wing on a model airplane where they twist the thing. And they've divided it up into little cells. This is the compression direction for the way he's twisting it, and this is the tension direction. That's what we're talking about, that wrinkling of the web when you load it. Called web crippling. It is a buckling of the web caused by this compression force on the bottom. There you see the little buckle marks. It's possible if you put a load here, you'll cause little buckle marks in these directions down in the web. And this is a mess. There's nothing, there's nothing else you can say about it, but it's, uh, it's all the theory is there, and it's been verified by test. If you have an interior load, the strength of the beam as measured in web crippling, this is the nominal strength. Eight-tenths of the thickness of the web squared plus onto one plus three times the length of your bearing plate. There's your length of your bearing plate. There's your length of your bearing plate divided by the depth of the beam times the thickness of the web divided by the thickness of the flange raised to 1.5 power square root of E, F sub Y, thickness of the flange, thickness of the web. Don't ask me who had time to do that. Somebody with a lot of money and a lot of time doing a big research project and uh, found out how strong these things were. Back when everything was A36 steel and they were all fat webs, probably never had to worry about it. The stronger the steel gets, the thinner the sections get, the more we have to do this research, find out where we're going to start getting into trouble. This is for an interior load, where the loads are dropping off on both sides. Or here, where the loads are dropping off on both sides. If you get near the support, like this one, as you can see, you're unsupported out here, so you have a much higher chance of this thing crippling. And there's... They find that you can't even have one equation to determine how much strength you have. Short plates have this equation, and long, longer plates have this equation. You say it looks the same. Well, kind of, kind of, pretty much. Okay, well, this number's different, and that's the same, and that's the same, but it's, it's actually got to have a different equation. What is a short plate? Here's a short plate right here. If L sub B is less than two-tenths of the depth, that's a short plate. If L sub B is longer than two-tenths of the depth of the beam, that's a long plate. Here's a short plate. Here's a long plate. You can see where you get more strength out of this one because you've you know, you're back in here further before the thing might have a tendency to cripple. How you get the answers? Well, I don't ever do that. I just write a maple or EES to get in there, and whenever I have to grade a quiz and you got a bunch of weird numbers, I just put the weird numbers in there and hit a button. You'll probably do the same thing once you get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're going to tell me again, aren't you? Concrete bearing strength. We know how strong the beam is now. We can stop it from crippling. We can stop it from just shearing. We can stop it from yielding. 
Now then, we got to talk to Mr. Concrete. What we'll do is we'll put that steel pad on top of the concrete, and we'll make it big enough so that the pressure between the bearing plate or the uh, base plate, whichever we're designing, uh, has got a low enough stress in the concrete that the concrete is happy. First, there'll be an L sub B, and then there'll be a dimension in the in and out of the paper. This is out of the ACI specs. The ACI people use the symbol P sub P, found to be 0.85 times the 28-day compressive strength times the area of the concrete that is uh, being loaded. You and I will immediately turn that into P subnominal or R subnominal or whatever we're going to do because that's what we use for nominal strength. Now then, that's if the plate fully covers the column. If it doesn't, turns out you get some more strength. You get the strength you had before, but you also get to raise it by the square root of the area of the concrete divided by the area of the plate. But you can't exceed this number. Right. Here are the specs. Here's the information out of the out of the concrete people. Cylinder concrete test, 0.85 FC prime, blah, 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 the curves. Here's what we just said. If your plate, which is called area one, completely covers your concrete, which is called area two in all of these equations, then you get 0.85 FC prime A1, just like a concrete cylinder test. And it starts breaking just like you saw your concrete cylinder breaking. Pieces start to fall off on the outside. If, on the other hand, you have the same size plate, but it's on a bigger piece of concrete, then as you see, all of this concrete is kind of contained inside this outer perimeter. And so the load picks up dramatically. If area 2 is bigger than area 1, if area 2 is equal to area 1, well, there it is. Square root of 1 is 1, and there's your equation, and there's your equation. But if area 1 is small compared to area 2, you get to add, they've tested this to verify it, square root of the area 2 divided by area 1. So the first thing I did is I had a big old floor, and I put a little old plate, and I put a load on it, and I found out the load could be 2 trillion tons. And they said, hey, jerk. You, there's a limit to this, you know. I admit that it, you know, it's a lot stronger, you know, if you got a lot of concrete outside of it. But all you're going to do is you're just going to push the plate. You're going to just push a little square hole in the concrete. So there's a limit to when this square root of A2 over A1 is permitted. That is when area 2 reaches 4 times area 1. When it reaches that limit, then you got to quit. Here's your equation. Here's your square, square root of area 2 when it reaches 4 area 1 over area 1. Area 1 cancels. Square root of 4, 2, 2 times 0.85. That's your limit. You can't go any bigger than that, no matter how much concrete you provide. And we'll get into that again next time.